Hello. All right, it's eight o'clock. Um, so um, let me just put my screen up now. Nice, we wait for more people to come in. Uh -oh. So um, how has your week been? Good. The weather's been pretty nice, at least where I live. Yeah. Well, summer is coming to an end. School starting in um, maybe three weeks, I think, or a, or a month. And um, for me, I haven't done any of my summer reading yet. I've been pushing that back. And uh, I think I should get started on that now. Wait one more minute. Hello, hi Michael. All right. 802 now. So this week is 13th week of physics and second week of rotational motion. All right. And actually, I don't think we're going to be able to cover everything we need to do for rotational motion in just these two weeks. So next week, we're going to have one more week of rotational motion and then we'll be done with it. All right. So it's going to be three weeks instead of two for um, three weeks instead of two for um, for physics, for rotational motion. All right. So let's get started. So the topics for today are torque, dynamics, energy, and momentum. So yet last week we did uh, kinematics and we did inertia. All right. So kinematics is one of those things that we've done before and dynamics, energy, and momentum are all similar things. And we're going to be talking about something new called torque as well. All right, so those are the topics for today. So first of all, torque. Before we go on to what torque is, let me first review all the rotational um, substitutes that we have for our formulas. So for example, instead of distance, we had angle theta. Instead of velocity, we had angular velocity, w. Instead of regular acceleration, a, we had alpha. Instead of mass, we had inertia. Okay, and the last thing that's missing from this list is force. 
right? What is the substitute for force? And that's where torque comes in. Torque is the substitute for force, and we write it with a T. And I like to write it with a squiggly line T, just to not confuse it with other things that have a T, like period, which is a T as well. Okay, so I write it with a squiggly line T. So that is what torque is. Torque is the angular um, usage of force, okay? So let me give you an example of torque. If you know what a wrench is, it's like one of those tools you can find in the toolbox. Kind of looks like this, and it will, and you can screw on bolts with it. Kind of like that, a nail or a screw. So that's a wrench, right? And I think you all know that the easiest way to twist on a screw with a wrench is to hold it at this end. All right, it's easiest to to push the screw and turn it around if you pull on the wrench at the end of this wrench, right? If you pull it near the axle or near the axis of rotation, then it gets really hard to push the screw in, okay? So as you can see here, even if you apply the same force on both of these areas, the amount that the screw rotates depends on the distance between the axis of rotation and um, where you are applying the force, all right? So torque, as you can see here, torque needs to, um, we need to consider our radius or our distance from the axis of rotation for our torque, because the torque depends on how far we are applying the force, right? Again, if we were to apply it here, we would have more torque. It would be easier to spin the, uh, the screw. If you were to apply it here, it would be harder. So this means that our definition of torque is equal to the force we apply multiplied by the radius of where this force is being applied, okay? So the farther away we are from the axis of rotation, um, the more torque that we basically have, okay? So I hope you guys can visualize why we need to consider the radius in for torque. And this definition is not perfect. So let me give you an example why. Why isn't it perfect? Well, if you were to apply a force at the end again, but if you were to pull it up, this way, what would that do? If you were to force, apply a good amount of force straight up like that, well, it's not gonna do anything, right? That's not gonna turn the screw. It's not gonna do anything at all, right? E even though you're applying a force at a distance R away, nothing's happening, right? The torque is not being applied. And that where that's where the angle between the force and the plane of the axis of rotation comes in. Because if you were to apply it at this angle, no torque would happen. But if you were to apply it at this angle, then you would have a lot of torque, okay? So the formula is we have to add in, we have to consider sine of theta. And theta is the angle between the plane of the wrench and your force vector. So let's say our force vector is this way, theta will be the angle here. So you have to consider the sine of theta into our equation. So as you can see here, if we were to apply this way, then theta would be 180 degrees. And the sine of 180 is zero, and we would have zero torque. Okay, and similarly, if we were to apply at a right angle, sine of 90 is one. So we get the maximum torque at a perpendicular to basically the lever arm. Okay, and a more, a more vigorous proof of why this works is that the force vector we have here can be divided into components, right? It has a, this component and has this component. This component right here, which is F cosine theta, it does nothing, right? It can't possibly do anything in terms of rotating the screw. So we only consider F sine theta as contributing to some torque. And so that's why we take F times R times the sine of theta. So that's the pure definition of um, torque. And someone asked, um, do we have to take it in degrees or radians? Well, that really depends on how you measure the angle, right? You can measure it in degrees, you can measure it in radians, okay? So the only reason why we had to use radians for our kinematic formulas and all our formulas for, uh, let's say, W and A alpha, it's because that's just how it works, right? We have to use radians for this, but for sine of theta, you can really use any kind of measurement for this angle. The angle is still the angle, 
okay? So it doesn't matter if you use degrees or radians for this um, theta, because the sine of theta will always end up at the same result, all right? So does everyone understand how torque works? All right, so let's do some problems now. Three problems, I don't think these should take that long. So um, three minutes for these. Once you get your answer, please chat it to me. And I'll let you know if you're right or not. All right, one more minute. All right, so I'm gonna explain these now. So basically, let's do the first one. I pull open a door with a force of 12 newtons directly perpendicularly to the plane of the door. 
if the door handle is 1.5 meters away from the hinge, what is the torque acting on the door? Well, the formula for torque is torque equals force times R times the side of theta. Since it's perpendicular, theta will be 90 degrees. Sine of 90 degrees is just one. So it's just force times radius times one. So that will just be 12 times 1.5, 18 newtons times meters. And newtons times meters is the unit we use for torque because we have force times radius and force is in newtons, radius is in meters. And the reason why we don't consider sine of theta in there is because the sine of theta, it doesn't really have a unit. It's just like a constant, a number, okay? So the unit for torque is newtons times meters. Next one, torque acting on a rod is 18 newtons times meters. What is the force? If the force acting is perpendicular and it acts 1.2 meters away, what's the magnitude of the force? This is this formula again, F times R times the sine of theta. Theta is 90 degrees, once again, because it's perpendicular. Sine of 90 is one, force times radius times one, and we'll just get force equals to the torque over the radius. So what will that be? We'll get force equals 18 over 1.2, 15. The last one, just the direct application of the torque formula again, F times R times the sine of theta. Theta in this case is 40 degrees. So it's just 10 times 0 0.5 times the sine of 40. And you will get 3.21 newtons times meters. All right, and someone asked, do we have to use degrees when we put in numbers into the calculator? Well, on your calculator, there is the mode button. And if you click on that button, you can see that your calculator is either in radian mode or in degree mode. If it's in radian mode, then it will accept radian values when you click in sine of theta. So if you say sine of 90 in the radian mode, it will take the 90 as 90 radians, okay? So you, if you want to use degrees in your inputs, you have to change the mode to degree mode, and then the calculator will accept the values as degree values. Okay, so that's how you would use the calculator in that situation. All right, any questions? Cool. Now we've gone over all the values we need. So here's a little handy dandy table of values. Um, maybe you could take a screenshot of or whatever you want to do with it. Okay, so it compares the translational quantities to our angular quantities and the relationship between them as an equation. All right, so take a screenshot, maybe write this down in your notebook uh, to keep as reference for later. Okay, is everyone done taking the screenshot? All right, let's get going. Now we've got angular dynamics. Regular dynamics, we went over it in, I think it was week three, Okay, so now we've got to do angular dynamics. The regular dynamics formula was the second law of motion, F equals MA. So we, we're just going to replace these values as for, with our angular quantities, so we can use this with angular motion. So force, the replacement is torque. Mass, the replacement is inertia. Acceleration, replacement is angular acceleration. So this is the angular dynamics formula. Torque equals inertia times alpha, all right? So basically we just took F equals MA and we replaced every single value in there with their corresponding angular value. All right, so that's basically all you need to know. This is, the, this is basically Newton's second law of motion just applied to rotational motion. All right, any questions? Cool. So just before you go on, if we have a system of objects, for example, a bunch of point masses around an axis, then the inertia you would take in this situation is the inertia of the whole system, all right? Since they're all moving together, if they all move together, then you would take all of them as one object, essentially, and you would take their inertia as all the combined inertias of all the objects. So if I would alter this formula a little bit, it would be, I of I total, okay, total inertia. Fiona, do you have a question? 
Yes, but what if the systems have like a different acceleration? So if they have different acceleration, I don't think that's going to happen a lot. So if they do have different accelerations, hmm, well, when you see a problem, you'll know how to do it. Okay, so you um, if there's if there's a constant torque acting on all the objects, then they're all going to go at the same acceleration. Okay, and that's if they're all connected to one another. And oftentimes, you're not going to have objects point masses, a system of point objects, but you're going to have more like two cylinders stacked on top of each other. Or you would have a carousel with lots of kids on it as point masses, and they will all be moving together. So most of the time, you're going to, most of the problems you encounter, you're not going to have a changing angular acceleration. Okay, so let's go on to some problems. Three problems here. Um, about five minutes for these. Okay, so once you get your answer, please chat that to me. I'll let you know if you're right or not.
But just a heads up, the second problem, the answer is not realistic at all. One more minute. All right, we'll now explain these problems. So a torque of 28 newton centimeters acts on a hollow ball of mass, 50 grams and radius 50 centimeters. What's the angular acceleration of the ball? Well, this asks for the formula, torque equals inertia times alpha. And for inertia, we're not really given the specific inertia of the object, but we're given the information we need to solve for the inertia. And it says it's a hollow ball, which means the inertia will be 2 thirds times m r squared. And we just plug this into the equation. And then we get tau, I think it's tau, that's the symbol, t times 3 over 2 m r squared equals angular acceleration. And you should get 3 360 radians a second squared. And uh, that is not very realistic at all. But you know, that's how it works. Okay, so now for the second one. Solid bowling ball of diameter 30 centimeters. Mystery mass undergoes a constant torque of 30 newtons times meters about the center. It is accelerating at 5 radians a second squared. What's the mass? Well, we'll just use torque equals I alpha again. Well, the inertia of a solid ball, that's 2 fifths mr squared. is multiplied by alpha and therefore mass will equal to I think it is mass is five halves torque over r squared alpha and you should get 667 kilograms okay so obviously this is not realistic at all you can't have a 667 kilogram bowling ball that is impossible for the last one, basically the same thing. And you would just use torque equals I alpha again. But this time, you don't have alpha, but you do have these two components. And then you can just use the equation W squared equals W zero squared plus two alpha D theta. Okay, so this we will choose you get 10 squared equals zero plus two alpha times two pi radians, right? Because that's one revolution. If you solve for alpha, 100 over four over pi, alpha is 7.96. This is your alpha. What about your inertia? Well, it's a can of soup. It is a cylinder. So torque equals one half mr squared alpha. And then um, you should find the torque. So just multiply all these things together. So 0. 0.5 times one, times, what's the radius, 0.015, wait, 0.3, sorry, 0.3 times alpha, which is 7.96, you should get 0 0.0036 radians a second squared. That's rather slow, okay? Oh, not radians per second squared. Um, the torque should be Newton centimeters. It's not, it's not the acceleration, this is the torque. All right, energy. So energy, 
for translational means, we had energy as one half mv squared. And this is the kinetic energy of any object that's moving. Like it's like, I don't know how to describe it, but um, it's actually moving itself. Okay. For example, a box sliding on the floor, an airplane flying through the air. And for any rotating object, it has rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so this is translational kinetic energy. I'll call it, uh, let me label it with TKE. And we have RKE, rotational kinetic energy. And for this one, we just replace all our values with what we need for angulars. So one half times, well, inertia for mass, and then W for velocity. So one half IW squared. Okay, so it's that simple. So your rotational kinetic energy, the formula is given by one half I W squared. All right. So that's basically the formula for rotational kinetic energy. And sometimes people get confused between what is translational and what is rotational kinetic energy. And basically, translational kinetic energy is the kinetic energy where the center of mass of an object is moving. This is the kinetic energy of the movement of the center of mass of this object. For a box lying on the floor, its center of mass is moving. But for rotational kinetic energy, center of mass doesn't need to move. But it could, okay? The center of mass doesn't need to move. So what do I mean here? Well, a common example is where you have a carousel. Draw a quick little carousel here. It's spinning, right? But its center of mass isn't really going anywhere. So, but it does have rotational kinetic energy. So the center of mass of a rotating kinetic energy object doesn't need to be moving, but it can. So what do I mean by when it can? Well, some objects have both translational and rotational kinetic energy. And a common example is with a rolling object. When a ball rolls on the floor, it's rotating. Yes, it's rotating about its center of mass and the center of mass is moving forward as well. So it has both translational and rotational kinetic energy. So in this case, the total kinetic energy of the ball would be by adding these two values together, rotational plus translational. So in the case where an object has both of these types of kinetic energies, it will be just add these types together. And rolling balls are actually basically all we're going to talk about next week. So that's basically kind of like a hint into what we're going to talk about later. Okay. But one example that a lot of people get confused about is with, um, let's say we have an axis and a point mass going around the axis. Some people say, hey, well, the object has some kind of, its center of mass is moving indeed, right? And it's spinning around an axis. So does it have both translational and rotational kinetic energy. So that's when they say, oh, the total kinetic energy of this thing is adding up these two things together. No, this is not right at all. You cannot add these two things together. This object, a point mass going around an axis, does not have both types of energy. It does not. So what do I mean here? Well, the type of energy this object has really depends on the reference frame you're comparing it to. So what do we mean by that? Well, if you were to compare to the reference frame of the axis, the point mass is revolving around an axis. It does have rotational motion. So in this case, if you were to take the axis as your reference point, then the kinetic energy will be in the form of one half IW squared. It wouldn't really have any translational kinetic energy in this frame of reference. But if you were to take the ball itself or the point mass itself as the point of reference, then there's not really an axis involved, right? You can't really see an axis when you're only focused on this point mass. So in this case, if you take the ball as your point of reference, it has translational kinetic energy. So what this means is that the kinetic energy of a point mass going around an axis, its kinetic energy can be represented in these two ways. It can be it can be represented as translational kinetic energy, and it can also be represented as rotational kinetic energy. And this is just this is based on the reference point in which you compare it to. But it doesn't have both of these types at the same time. These are just two different ways 
you could represent the energy the object has. So in reality, these two values are equal. Okay? Because the total energy it has is still the same, except that these are just two different ways you can represent it. And I'll just prove why this works first. So we cancel the one halves. mv squared equals, well, i of a point mass, the inertia of a point mass is mr squared. Oh, cancel the m's. v squared equals r squared w squared. And take the square root, v equals r w. And we know that this is a true equation. So the initial equation is also right. So this is just a special case where the kinetic energy of the object can be represented in different ways based on where your frame of reference is. All right, any questions about that? So to summarize things, some objects only have translational kinetic energy. For example, a crate sliding along the floor that only has translational kinetic energy. Some objects only have rotational kinetic energy, such as the carousel spinning around in a wrap. Okay. And some objects have both translational and rotational kinetic energy, such as a ball rolling along the floor. And the last thing you need to know is that sometimes the object's kinetic energy can be represented by rotational form or by translational form. And one last thing you should need to know is that we can't have energy without work, right? So in translational motion, work was defined as force times distance. And work for rotational means is defined as, well, the replacement for force is torque. Replacement for distance is theta. So torque times theta will get you the work for um, a rotating object. Okay, So that's basically the rotational format of the work formula. All right, let's do some problems. So I'm gonna give you guys five minutes for this. Once you get your answer, please chat that to me and I'll let you know if you're right or not.
Come on a minute. All right, I will explain these problems now. So in the first one, we want to find the rotational kinetic energy of the cylinder. Rotational kinetic energy is given by one half I W squared. So it will be one half times, well, what's the inertia of a cylinder? One half MR squared. So one half times one half MR squared. So this is the inertia. And then we have our W squared. Plugging in values, we're supposed to get 5.88, uh, what is it, joules. Next one, solid soccer ball is dropped from a nine-year tall tree and is given a spin so that it rotates at 10 radians per second. The ball has mass one kilogram, 28 centimeters in diameter. What's the total kinetic energy of the ball when it hits the ground? Well, Energy is still conserved, right? The conservation of energy still doesn't, it's not broken by um, the fact that rotational energy also exists. So everything has to follow the law of conservation of energy. Okay, so the initial energy is equal to the final energy. So let's take the initial point. The initial point, it has, it's spinning, the ball is spinning. So it has rotational kinetic energy along with gravitational potential energy. At the final position, it's still rotating. Its rotation is unaffected by the fall, and it has rotational and translational kinetic energy. So this is one of the situations where the object has both types of energy. All right, energy is conserved. So the total kinetic energy here is the same thing as the total energy up here. So if we solve for the energy here, we'll get the energy that ends up as kinetic energy at the end. So all we need to do is solve for the energy contained in here. So that's just going to be, well, rotational kinetic energy is one half I W squared, and we just add that to MGH. So what's that going to be? One half times, well, that's two fifths MR squared, W squared plus MGH. If you were to solve this, I think you should get 34.57 joules of energy when it hits the ground. Okay, just the conservation of energy. The last one, pretty simple. It has 5,000 joules of rotational kinetic energy. Constant frictional torque of 10 Newton centimeters slows it down until it stops. So how many revolutions does it spin? Well, in this case, we're just gonna use work equals torque times theta. Work can also be represented as the change in kinetic energy, once again. New kinetic energy is 5,000. Torque is um, 10. So theta equals 500. And to get the revolutions, we just divide by two pi. Since there are two pi uh, revolutions, there are two pi radians in one revolution. So solving that, you will get 79.58 revolutions. Okay, just the application of the work formula. All right, three more problems here. Um, actually, skip the first one and just do the second one, the, the second and third ones. Okay. So I'll give you guys three minutes for this one. Actually, how about four minutes? Four minutes for these. Once you get your answer, please chat that to me and let you know if you're right or not.
One more minute. All right, I'm going to go over this problem now, or these problems. So a vertical rod of length 0 0.8 meters is pivoted at one end on the surface of a table. The rod is given a tiny push so that it falls. What's the translational velocity of the tip of the rod just before it hits the table? Well, let's draw out a little diagram here. Well, the rod is vertical and it's just gonna fall over and it's gonna hit the ground, hit the table. And just before it says it hits the table, it is it has rotational kinetic energy. So kinetic energy, so energy is conserved in this problem. So in this problem, we're just going to use conservation of energy to get our answer. Okay. So in this case, well, why did the object gain energy, kinetic energy? Where did that energy come from? Well, it came from gravitational potential energy, right? As you can see here, the center of mass of the rod is up here at some kind of height. And then it falls to the ground. And this gravitational potential energy, that's why the gravitational potential energy was converted into rotational kinetic energy. Okay? So we're just going to use mgh, initial energy, equals the final energy, which is 1 half iw squared. What is h? Well, h is where the center of mass of the object is. And since it's a rod, it's just going to be in the middle of the rod. So it's going to be 1 half of its length above the ground. So let's just plug in values here. Mg times 1 half L equals 1 half times, what's the inertia of a rod pivoted at one end? 1 third ML squared times W squared. Before we do any canceling, observe how we want the translational velocity of the tip of the rod just before it sits the table. We don't want the angular velocity. So now after we get the angular velocity, we want to convert it into translational velocity. Translational velocity equals W times R. And the radius in this case is the distance from the pivot, which is the length of the rod. So V equals W times L. Wait, look right here. We have L squared times W squared, which means this is V squared. So we can put V directly into this equation, MV squared. Canceling, we're going to get V equals the square root of 3GL. And uh, let me just do a quick calculation. 0 0.8 times 9.8 times 3. Take the square root. B equals 4.8 meters per second. All right. So that's just uh, energy conservation. For the next one, a motor has a power output of 100 watts. This is connected to a bicycle wheel at rest, and it accelerates. Someone asked about what did it mean that the rod was pivoted? Well, a pivot is basically another word for hinge. Okay, so it's a secured axis of rotation. So it has to rotate about that axis. So now for the last problem, if you remember from our initial class, from our class about um, conservation of energy, we know that power P is equal to work done over time. Work done is changing kinetic energy. And so then our change in kinetic energy is equal to power times time. Well, what's the kinetic energy? One half I W squared equals P times time. And then you would just solve for W in this case. Since I'm running a little low on time, um, that's basically how you do the problem, but I'm not going to evaluate the answer. Okay. So are there any questions about these problems? All right, cool. Now we've got momentum. 
As we know, momentum, translational momentum is found when the object's center of mass is moving, just like translational kinetic energy, okay? And spinning objects also have momentum, okay? And this is called angular momentum. So what is the formula for angular momentum? Regular momentum is given by mass times velocity. So rotational momentum is given by, well, mass is inertia, velocity is W, I times W. So that will be your formula for rotational momentum. So if an object is rotating at some kind of angular velocity W, then you would just multiply that by inertia to get your final answer. Okay, so that will be your momentum. And the formula for impulse, impulse is, let me write that with a, I don't know, a lowercase i, because I don't want you to confuse that with inertia. So impulse with a lowercase i is equal to force times time for translational motion. So impulse will equal to torque times time for your rotational motion. So you may ask, why didn't I replace time with an angular value? Well, time is time, and so time doesn't really change between your uh, time is just time, right? It doesn't matter if you're talking about translational or rotational motion, time stays constant. So these are the four rotational formulas for momentum. And one last thing you need to know is that is with the conservation of momentum. Uh, remember when we did translational motion, momentum was conserved if there was no net external force, force acting on the system. Well, if we can't really use force with rotational motion, so we have to change the conservation of momentum into rotational forms by saying no net external torque. Okay, if there's no net external torque around a specific axis, then rotational momentum is conserved. Okay, so that's the basically the rewriting of the conservation of momentum for rotational momentum. And one last thing to know is back to the analogy with an object spinning around an axis. From our discussion with kinetic energy, we know that the kinetic energy of this ball can be talked about in, can be represented in translational motion or rotational motion. And we can do the same with our momentum. So the, so the cool thing is, is that any object's momentum can be represented in both angular form and translational form. So all the boxes or all the collisions we've done, linear collisions, all of those momentums can also be represented with rotational momentum by changing our reference point. So in all the translational mo momentum we've talked about so far, our reference point is the object itself, right? We watch the object as it moves. And that's how we get m times v. But if we compare this to an axis of rotation, then the rotational motion or the, the translational momentum can be represented as rotational momentum about that axis. So what do I mean here? Well, let's take a point here on our diagram. Let's call this point P. About this point P, around this point P, the distance between P and the object changes. All right? So the radius of rotation or the distance is changing. So we can kind of represent this as angular motion. So any kind of linear momentum can also be talked about in terms of rotational momentum, okay? And the formula relating linear momentum and rotational momentum is mass times velocity times R equals I times W. So R, in this case, is the perpendicular distance between the path of the object and your point P. So if you compare your momentum to point P, then you can represent it with this kind of R. Okay, so this is how you can basically turn the linear momentum of an object in terms of rotational momentum. Okay, so you can basically rewrite linear momentum in terms of rotational momentum by changing your reference point so that you're not focusing on the box, but you're focusing on an axis of rotation or point P. Okay, so this is the formula that can relate or basically write your translational momentum in terms of rotational momentum.
All right. Are there any questions? You want to see the proof for this formula? It'll be m times v times r equals, well, we'll take everything as a point mass, right? Because its center of mass is the only thing that really matters when we talk about translational momentum. So it's just going to be mr squared times w, canceling our r's, mv equals mrw. r times w is v. So mv equals mv. And that's the proof for this formula. All right. So this formula basically comes in handy when you want to take the object's momentum or a linear form of momentum and turn that into rotational momentum. All right, but this is kind of an advanced topic. So you're only really going to see a good usage of this formula on maybe um, physics competitions. But normally you're not going to use this formula that much. Okay, so are there any questions? All righty. Let's do some problems. So take three minutes to do these. And um, I think it seems like I'm going to go over time for this class. So um, after these two problems, we have more problems. And I think it's really important that I get through these problems before we end class this week. So um, if you do need to leave, at 9 o'clock p.m. Central Time, then feel free to go and you can watch the replay later. Or you can stay and maybe I'll go like five minutes over to explain those last three problems because those are pretty important. All right, so for now, I'll work on these two problems. All right, I'll go over these problems now. So what is the rotational momentum of a spinning hoop of diameter one meter and mass 800 grams that spins at two hertz? Well, the momentum, rotational momentum is defined as inertia times W, okay? So what's the inertia of a spinning hoop? MR squared, we'll multiply that by the W. Well, we don't have W, because W needs to be in radians per second. So how do we turn frequency into um, radians per second? Well, one thing we know is that period equals one over frequency. And period also equals to distance over speed, OK? So 2 pi over W equals 1 over F. F or W equals to 2 pi times f. So replace w with 2 pi f in this equation, and you should get, I think it should be 2.51 um, kilograms 
times meters per second. Okay, I think that's it. All right. So now for the last one, Bob jumps on a carousel, a mini carousel at the playground and starts spinning with Bob on it. So, well, we can take this interaction as a collision, all right? Because Bob kind of collides with the, the carousel, right? And the thing is, there's no net force. There's no net external force acting on the system. There's no net external torque acting on the system. So we can just use the conservation of momentum. Initial momentum is the mass of Bob times the velocity of Bob. Final momentum, well, we'll take it as I times W. And the important thing to note is that it's not just the, the carousel rotating after the collision, okay? Bob also rotates along with the carousel. So in this equation, we need to add the inertias of Bob and the carousel. I carousel plus I Bob times W, okay? So the angular velocity in the end is mass of Bob times the velocity of Bob over, well, the inertia of the carousel, cylinder, one half, Hemings carousel, radius squared, plus, well, Bob, we can treat him as a point mass. So it's just gonna be mass of Bob times radius squared. And if you plug values in, um, you'll get your answer, okay? But um, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm not gonna do that right now. So do you guys understand how you would do these problems? All right, so someone's asked, um, is there a difference between the words angular and rotational? There is not, okay? So these are just two different words that we use that we use interchangeably, and there's really no difference between them, okay? So just in case you were wondering. Two last problems here. These problems are pretty important. So um, I'll give you guys five minutes to do these, maybe, maybe six minutes. Okay, how about seven? We'll do it until nine, 10. So if you do need to leave right now, feel free to do so, and then you can watch the recording later. But if you're willing to stay, um, please consider these problems because you're gonna see these quite a bit in the future. All right, so if you get your answer, please chat that to me. And I'll let you know if you're right or not.
One more minute. Okay, I will go over the solutions for these two problems. Yeah? So for the first problem, if you were to analyze it a little bit, you know that if you've seen um, one of those um, space movies with the space stations that rotate, um, when, when something rotates, you have centripetal force, right? And we basically use that to stimulate artificial gravity on rotating spaceships. So if the rockets can propel the spaceship to a speed that's high enough to, um, to um, provide enough centripetal force so that the people on the spaceship feel the force of gravity on them, then we want to find out how long the rockets need to fire in order to increase the momentum of um, the spaceship until it's enough so that the people will feel enough gravity. So let's get going with this. First of all, we want to find out how long the rockets need to fire in order to get the spaceship to a high enough speed. So basically, we were going to use the formula for impulse. All right, so it's going to be torque times time equal to the change in momentum, change in momentum of the spaceship. And in the end, the spaceship needs to be revolving at a high enough angular velocity so that the people will feel force of gravity on them. So now we need to find out what that angular velocity is. So then we can plug this in to our equation for momentum. So what is the angular velocity? Well, we know that centripetal force is given by mv squared over r. And this must equal to mg, OK? But we don't really want to have translational velocity here. We want an angular velocity that we can use for angular momentum, OK? So then we'll just use the formula V equals WR. Plugging this into this equation, we're going to have W squared R squared over R. So W squared R equals G. W squared equals square root of G over R. W equals W equals the square root of G over R. OK, so this is the, um, the rotational velocity or the angular velocity that we need to obtain in order for the spaceship to stimulate artificial gravity. Now let's plug this into momentum. Momentum equals I times W. What is the I? Well, since the spaceship is so big and so massive, we can basically neglect the masses of the people. So we'll just take the inertia of the spaceship. So this is a cylinder, one half times M, r squared m cylinder r squared and then we multiply this by w which is the square root of g over r simplifying a little bit i think we're going to have let me see r times square root of g r okay so now we combine these together we get time will equal to all of this junk divided by the torque that the, that the rockets can apply. So what is that torque? Well, we have two rockets and they're both um, applied, applying force at a distance of the radius away from um, the center. So then we get the force here is 500 Newtons. Force here is 500 Newtons. So the torque here is 500 R, 500 R. So we add them together, 1000 R. So 1000 R. This conveniently cancels out the R on the top. So if you were to calculate all this, I think you should get a value of around 600 seconds, which is around 10 minutes. OK, any questions about this? All right, now for the last one. This is kind of a tricky problem. A wood block of mass 7 kilograms is connected to a rod of length 1 meter and mass 3 kilograms 
pivoted at one end. Bullet of mass 22 grams is shot into wood block and becomes embedded in the block. As a result, the block will swing. The whole contraption actually swings up and then it will increase at a height h. So what is that height? Well, first of all, you might think that, hey, I can use conservation of energy here, right? The energy of the, the bullet turns into the energy of the, the block and the rod and everything rising up a distance h. Well, that's not actually true because the bullet becomes embedded in the block, which means it's an inelastic collision. So basically what we need to do is after we get the friction out of the way, after we do all our calculations so that um, we have a situation in which friction has been uh, removed from our situation, then we can use conservation and uh, conservation of energy. So we did kind of like a similar problem a few weeks ago with the block moving into another block and they collide inelastically. You want to find how far the spring will compress. Well, this is same, the same thing, okay? We just use conservation of momentum first to find out the instantaneous speed of the blocks after the collision. And then we can use conservation of energy because after that, there's no friction being involved, okay? So let's first use conservation of momentum to find out what's the speed of the block and the bullet after the collision. So what is that going to be? Well, if we pretend nothing else is there, but we just have a collision between two objects. So we just use conservation of linear momentum, m bullet. Let me just say the mass of the bullet is um, m1. m1, mass of the block is m2, mass of the rod is m3. Okay, just for simplicity. So m1 v1 equals v times m1 plus m2. Right, this is just um, translational uh, momentum conservation. Right, we did this a lot. So V will equal to M1 V1 over M1 plus M2. Right, that's pretty simple. So right after the collision, this is the instantaneous velocity that these objects are going at. But now, since the objects are gonna go out in rotational motion, we need to turn this um, instantaneous velocity into angular velocity, okay? Because we can't calculate, um, we can't calculate our rotational kinetic energy without having rotational velocity, okay? So how do we get rotational velocity? Well, V equals WR. And what is the radius of motion? Well, these two objects right here, they're right here. So the radius of rotation is just the length of the rod. So we just multiply this by L to get our angular velocity. Now we calculate the amount of kinetic energy the system has right now. So what's the kinetic energy it has? Well, it's gonna be one half I W squared. And this will equal to the final gravitational potential energy the final state has. So what is the kinetic energy at this point? Well, one half times the inertias of all of these objects. So we need to calculate the inertia of the bullet, the inertia of the block, plus the inertia of the rod times W, which is right here. Okay, so this will be our, um, our kinetic energy right after the collision. So now we can use um, conservation of energy to calculate the gravitational potential energy the objects have after um, in the final state, okay? But note that the rod rises a different height than the blocks. Okay, if we were to visualize this like this, draw out a better diagram. As we can see here, at this point, this is a height h. But for the rod, it's a lot smaller distance because the center of mass of the rod is a lot less far away from the pivot point than um, the block and the bullet. And the actual, the cool thing is, is that based on logic, since the block and the bullet are two times as far away, from the pivot point, then the center of mass of the rod, then this H here is gonna be one half of the H down here. All right, does everyone understand how that works? Um, you could kind of prove this with um, geometry if you wanted to. But, so then we're just gonna have MGH. Well, the masses of the bullet and the block go up a height of H. So 
m1 plus m2 times h. And then we add that to m3 times 1 half h. Okay, so this is the big formula that we have. So if we were to calculate all of this and plug in values and do all of that, then we'll get our answer for h. Okay, so basically this was just a combination of momentum and energy. All right, so I'm not gonna um, calculate the answer, but as long as you guys get how that works, then I think you guys should be fine. All right, you guys understand? Cool, so that will be it for today. And next week, we're gonna be talking about um, rolling objects. It's all gonna be about rolling objects down a plane, rolling objects without slipping, okay? So I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Guys. Thank you. Yeah, no Bye. problem, guys. Bye.